Heartbeat Alaska is brought to you in part by Coca-Cola. By Cook Inlet Region Incorporated, an Alaska Native Corporation promoting economic and social progress for people throughout the state. By the generous support of the Alaska Native Health Board. Welcome to Heartbeat Alaska. I'm Jeannie Green, bringing you native news across the north. Today we travel to Aleknagik for a brief look at the 1993 graduation, then down to Heidelberg, where Leonard Hamilton, a Haida Indian, was born, then on over to Ketchikan for a ceremony honoring Indian warriors. Elise Pactikok is with us again, plus we have news briefs from around the state. But first, here's Gary Fife with National Native News. Thank you, Jeannie. This is National Native News. I'm Gary Fife. The chairman of the Senate Indian Affairs Committee says he's not pleased with the fiscal 1994 budget the Clinton administration is proposing for the Indian Health Service. Chairman Daniel Inouye sharply criticized the $1.88 billion budget when acting director Michael Lincoln testified before the committee Thursday. Among other things, Inouye criticized a proposed reduction of more than 700 IHS positions to save money. If that happened, the IHS would absorb more than a third of the personnel cuts slated for the entire Department of Health and Human Services. Inouye is also displeased that there's not new construction money in the budget. $75 million would go to finish the Alaska Native Medical Center in Anchorage, but 15 other facilities would be left waiting. Hillary, uh, Noye says with the emphasis President Clinton and First Lady Hillary Rodden, Rodham Clinton are placing on health care, he finds it hard to believe they would endorse the IHS budget proposals. The auction and sale of four Seneca false face masks was halted when four representatives of the Haudenosaunee peoples showed up during the proceedings. Sotheby's, the internationally known New York City Art Auction House, had scheduled the four pieces to go on the block despite earlier contacts with the natives who raised objections to the sale. Peter Jemison, chairman of the Haudenosaunee Standing Committee on Burial Rules and Regulations, says they walked to the front of the room and no one bid on the items. Jemison says Sotheby's appeared somewhat ignorant of the spiritual values of the items, but they were willing to meet and talk with the native delegation. Legal representatives for Sotheby said they would proceed with the sale because they had a contract with a consigner to sell the items. The U.S. Senate Indian Affairs and Agriculture Committees held a joint hearing on the 25th to take a look at barriers Native Americans face in federal food programs. Tribal leaders said the commodity foods the government gives to tribes often don't have enough variety or go far enough. They said food stamps often fail to cover a whole month's needs. Congress is considering whether to change the monthly income reporting requirements for food stamp eligibility. They're also considering whether to stagger the issuance of food stamps over the month to deal with reports of price gouging by stores around the time food stamps are issued. Another concern is about the nutritional value of the commodity foods the government distributes. Congressional panels say they want to make federal commodity food programs more effective and to eliminate barriers to Native American participation. And finally, an art show now on display at the National Cowboy Hall of Fame in Oklahoma chronicles the story of the last Native American warriors held as prisoners of war by the U.S. Army. It's called Beyond the Prison Gates, the Fort Marion Experience and its Artistic Legacy. It shares the stories of 72 Native men shipped to a Florida prison camp and the beginnings of what later became famous as Plains Indian art styles. It contains photos, newspaper accounts, and pencil drawings on ro ruled notebook paper created by the Kiowa, Comanche, Arapaho, Cheyenne, and Caddo warriors. They were captured in the 1876 conflict called the Red River Wars. 
The exhibit will travel to the Institute of American Indian and Alaska Native Arts in New Mexico, then to Los Angeles, California, and return to Tulsa, Oklahoma in February of 1994. This is National Native News, and for Heartbeat Alaska, I'm Gary Fife. Nunan <laughs> If you have news or information from your village or community, please call Heartbeat Alaska, area code 907-563-3507, or fax 907-563-7079. Johnny Hawk is no longer president of Chalista Corporation, effective June 1st. The decision was mutually agreed upon by Mr. Hawk and the board of directors. In 1991, Johnny Hawk was arrested by the Fish and Wildlife Service for hunting geese out of season. He was made to publicly apologize and to make a video. That video itself was the subject of controversy. Chalista shareholders live in the yukon Kuskokwim Delta region. Another president has stepped down. On May 15th, Roy Ewan replaced Wilson Justin. Wilson Justin was the president of Atna Corporation. Mr. Justin has said, however, that he does look forward to the change. I'm glad to hear that. Now maybe I'll get that story that Wilson has promised me on stick writing. We turn now to Alegnagik for the 1993 graduation. They sent me this video. <laughs> Graduating from the 8th grade in Alegnagik were Geneva Andrews, Theodore Bavala, Christopher Olson, Jeremy Petluska, and Nicholas Tinker. Graduating from kindergarten to first grade were Christina Michael and Michelle Snyder. 36 students attend Alegnagik School, kindergarten through 8th grade. The school has been recognized for their excellent interdisciplinary approach to teaching. Congratulations to all the graduates. And now, it's off to a fun summer. A lot of the folks at Olegnagik are off to fish camp for the summer. I'd like to add that on the previous story of Johnny Hawk, I failed to mention that he is still on the board of directors. Very important note. And speaking of summers, I spoke with Leonard Hamilton about his plans for this summer. They're pretty exciting. He's a Haida, born in Heidelberg. Heidelberg is located approximately 45 miles due west southwest of Ketchikan in southeast Alaska. It's home to the only Haida village in the United States. It was founded in 1911 by the consolidation of three former Haida Indian villages. 95% of its residents are Haida Indians whose ancestors came from Queen Charlotte Islands of British Columbia. Although Heidelberg is the only Haida village in the United States, Many other Haidas occupy other villages as well. Like many other Southeast Alaskan Indian tribes, the Haida people are a strong and proud people. One of the things that I most fondly remember um, is kind of wandering around the beaches and just enjoying and being fascinated with all the the sea life and everything that was going on, you know, and every time you you move a rock and there was all kinds of things moving around and all the little pools had little fish in them or crabs or sea urchins and things were always, you know, I, I always remember it as being very um, 
enjoyable and always discovering something new, you know, and, and uh, fascinated with that. And Leonard Hamilton was born in Heidelberg. As with other Native people around the state, the influence of Western culture had an impact on his life. My parents and, and uh, of that generation were uh, boarding school kids, you know, and they'd all been, they'd all been taken away from them. And, and Heidelberg was one of the only places where they still spoke the language a lot, but there was still a lot of, uh, not just in Heidelberg, but most of the communities in southeastern and I guess other um, areas of Native Americans had went through the same thing, you know, that there was, people were discouraged and sometimes punished for, for practicing some of their old ways. And, and um, there were no totems being done during that time, no, uh, uh, there was no pride in, in, uh, in the art at that time. And, and uh, it wasn't until I was probably in junior high or early high school that, that I was, I started dancing again. There was a dance group starting and, and uh, I was fascinated by it because it told who I was and, and made me proud of who I was. And Today, Hamilton lives in Anchorage. However, his ties to his Haida culture are unlikely to be severed ever again. I'd say three quarters of the town are related to me in some way or another, the second, third cousins or aunties and uncles. And, and, uh, <coughs> and I try to get home every, uh, at least um, every year uh, in end of July or early August to get in my fishing. Or Going home also means replenishing his supply of his native food, like dry seaweed. Family knows that, you know, I like it, and, and so they send it to me. And Another way of nurturing his culture was born out of an idea by him and a few others at CINA 10 years ago. Leonard's loneliness from home ultimately resulted in a celebration hosted by natives for people of all cultures. Here's another, here's another four-legged friend that you don't want to cross. Life in Anchorage is filled with year-round activities for the general population. For years, though, there were no major native cultural events. Hamilton was a major player in changing that. Along with Franklin Berry, Patricia Cochran, and May Stanley, he created one of the largest Native celebrations in the state, Spirit Days. It was so important to the community, and, and uh, at least to us, and to, to share our culture with, with other people and to appreciate others. You know, we had um, lots of people showed up, and we had uh, a whole variety of performers and arts and craftsmen, and <clears throat> so the decision was made to make it an annual event. Yeah. Although we all have different uh, songs and different languages and um, different uh, beliefs, we, we still are happy to see people be what they are, and especially the sharing in the community. Part of that sharing means supporting other cultural groups from Alaska and around the country. Tonight we're, we're going to have a potlatch and we want you to come and join us and have fun. Well, and this past year was exciting because we were able to, um, to sponsor uh, a welcome uh, potlatch for the American Indian Dance Theater when they were in town. Leonard Hamilton may no longer live in Heidelberg. But today, thanks to him, the Founding Fathers of Spirit Days, and the present Spirit Days Board of Directors, thousands of people gather to fellowship and experience this special gift to Anchorage. That dried seaweed in the video looked really good to me. I was born in Sitka. Thank you very much, Francis Nadkong, for taking the video, and also Doreen Edenshaw for all the hard work you did on this story. Spirit Days this year is on June 12th and 13th, and as usual, it's drug and alcohol free. They're charging admission for the first time, $2 per person. It's not much. They normally wouldn't, but they didn't get their Alaska State Council of the Arts grants, unfortunately, so they have to charge, but grandmas go free. We'll be back with more news from around the state right after these messages. May I help you, sir? Yeah, I'll have a Coca-Cola. You sure you want a Coke? Yeah, I want a Coke. Okay, pal. Oh! Ah!
Why did you order a Coke? It, it tastes good. You didn't care if it was a Coke. You just want oh, a Coke. I'll just have a cola. I'll just have a cola. I'll just have a cola. I'll just have a I'll just have a I'll just have a I'll just have a Coke. Ooh. Ah. You hear that, guys? A Coca-Cola. <laughs> See ya, pal. Oh. Ah. Utok kalini nga inyo kuya naktuk raw galo aktok. Utok kanabot aw lakak tut kaw nagini nga si kaganak singman. Ikayutik sa niktut utok kaliwat ay mirala sibluwit. Ilisimagovit inyong mikpilgoy liramik ikayok tikak tukra ramik kukurak luwit mingo aktok vich utok kanakakavik timim iluak niksang agun sabaktit na kakukula luta 800-770-0138. Hi, my name is Sam Lambo. <laughs> but I'm sorry to feel to everyone. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I just totally blanked out what I was watching. Well, I'm marketing director for Heartbeat Alaska. If you have a need for your product or business to reach thousands of people across the north. I was watching him, I guess. I keep my eyes on the camera. I'm sorry. Oh, darn, that was going so good. If you have a need for your product or business to reach thousands of people across the north. <laughs> Oh, am I professional, huh? <laughs> well, we can do it for you. Heartbeat Alaska is the only Native news aired statewide. Owned by Natives, produced by Natives, staffed by Natives. What? Oh, I forgot my... <laughs> Heartbeat Alaska is the only Native news aired statewide. Owned by Natives, produced by Natives, staffed by Natives, for natives, about natives, but our stories appeal to everyone. Get your business or product out there. Put a commercial on Heartbeat Alaska. I'll show you how easy it is. Call me, I'm Sam Lamebull. Is my eyes closing? I feel like they are. I gotta stop that. We can do it for you. Think of Jeannie, she said have fun. I'm gonna have fun on this one. Jeannie, this one's for you. Get your business or product out there. Ugh. Scratch it, that one wasn't for you, that one was for me. Call me on Sam Lamebull. Jim Barker spent almost two decades taking pictures in Southwest Alaska, where the villagers there welcomed him and his camera into their homes. Most of his pictures chronicle the subsistence lifestyle and the adaptability and strengths of the Yupik people. Barker now lives in Fairbanks. He has recently compiled his photographs into a book called Always Getting Ready. Rhonda McBride of public television station KYUK asked him about the title and the stories behind the pictures. No title came to mind for this at all. And I kept thinking of, um, of uh, out at out of Luckinuck, I went out uh, photographing Clyde Smith when he was when he was uh, 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 hunting out there, and he said, "You know, it seems kind of interesting that I seem to get more birds when I uh, when I when I don't need them. You know, when, in other words, when I'm I'm not really wanting them, I I seem to to get more." And I thought, "Well, okay, I'll, maybe a title will come to mind if I'm not searching for it." <laughs> you know, and. Uh, uh, so I kind of like laid in wait for a while, but then there was a point that where uh, the book is coming to an end and we really need a title. And uh, uh, finally, in desperation, and I, 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 I was talking with uh, um, Agnes Kelly Bostrom, who lives with Ed Bostrom in, in Fairbanks, and I said, is there anything about in the spring, as, as, as the winter breaks and spring starts, and any, you know, any feeling about um, any, any saying about oak, okay, you know, you know, the, the hunting season starts. Is there anything, any any saying or anything like that? And she came up with, uh, uh, she just kind of rolled right out. She said, "All through the year, we are getting ready, getting ready for fishing, for berry picking, for potlatches, getting ready for winter." We're always getting ready to go somewhere to get foods. And because we are so religious, you know, we are always getting ready for the next life. And I, this just kind of rolled right out, and I was just writing as fast as I could, you know, because I wasn't even really expecting that to come out. And 
it, it threw me for a long time, and it had a nice uh, rhythm to it, but it threw me because the words themselves are so simple, and I, I somehow it didn't... And it no. seems like it, it's the key to understanding subsistence, which your photos are about. Mm -hmm. Well, it, it's really true. I mean, the idea r I liked really a lot in the way that it conveys that, that in a subsistence life that you just don't sit here and, and wait for things to come, that you have to really get you know, very much involved. And considering how subsistence politically is being looked at now, and there is a tremendous amount of number of Alaskans out of the Bush area, I mean in, in Anchorage and Fairbanks area, that really do not understand much about rural Alaska. Um, and they, they, they don't understand that it involves a constant attention, constant, constant preparation. And I really felt that that was the message that came through with this really well. Well, it seems like in your photos, I don't know whether you're doing it consciously or just because you've been out here and, and, you, and you love the people so much, but they seem to give, give a lot of dignity to the, to the people you're photographing. Did you consciously in your work try to, try to give your subjects dignity, or is that just something that emerged on its own? Well, I, I look back at it, and I, I apparently did. I mean, I, I think it has to do with the, just the way I see and experience people and um, uh, the tremendous amount that I've learned uh, and feel just extraordinarily grateful to, to, to the area um, for, for what I've learned. And in many ways, um, uh, Robin and I, you know, we- Robin is your wife. Wife, yeah. I, I, we worked on this book um, almost, you know, kind of the, the, the feeling of after all of the years we spent out here and the phot photography and the interviewing and all the kinds of things is that that this book was a way of kind of like giving something back um, uh, there are you know so many times when people and I would have really liked to have been able to you know, give them prints um, uh, uh, when I was when I was shooting, and it just simply was not possible for me to, to give out in as many prints. It was just it was just not possible, and in, and so in some ways, this book is that of kind of giving back our you know the, the amount of stuff that we've learned and, and and documented. We'll be back with Rhonda McBride from KYUK in Bethel, and we'll hear more about Jim Barker in his book. We turn now to Southeast Alaska to Ketchikan. Willard Jackson created a ceremony honoring Indian warriors. His brother Richard lost his best friend in Vietnam. And this, of course, is in observance of Memorial Day. We pray to you this evening and give thanks for this opportunity. Willard Jackson is a member of the Clinkett Tongass tribe in Southeast Alaska. On March 6th, his vision was given life in the form of a ceremony honoring Indian warriors, veterans of the two world wars, the Korean conflict, the Vietnam War, and the Desert Storm. The ceremony was part of Metlakatla's annual cultural awareness celebration. The Tongass tribe of Ketchikan, Tantaquan, meaning sea lion people, are a small group of Clinkets, the southernmost tribe of the Clinket nation. With the help of Red Thunder, a Plains Indian group from Calgary, Ontario, the Veterans Memorial Ceremony was a healing process long overdue. Seventy Indian warriors were honored. Their families were called forward while Red Thunder paid tribute through sign language to the special group gathered that day the Indian Warriors of Southeast Alaska. Spirit Days, 93, 
welcomes you to our 10th annual celebration gathering. Join us as we honor grandmothers of all cultures, a full lineup of dance and drum performers, traditional sports, food, arts and craft booths for both days. That's June 12th and 13th at Windler Junior High, brought to you by Spirit Days Incorporated. Admission $2, grandmothers go free. See you there. Thanks to the student body of Electric X School for that message. Well, let's travel now to Barrow and find out what Elise Tacticock is doing this Memorial Day weekend. You'd think after 18 years in the Alaskan bush, I would know better. Never plan a dinner around the availability of an eggplant in your local emporium. I made this mistake the other day and ended up trying to figure out how many little Japanese eggplants would equal two medium-sized regular eggplants. I then spent an inordinate amount of time baking and scraping about 30 of them in the hope of getting the equivalent amount of filling. This is not a task calculated to make your Saturday a breeze, nor is it one that will cause you to be a happy hostess seven hours later when you finish peeling that last stupid little eggplant. It's those one-of-a-kind, only-one-time items that come as an impulse that make you crazy. You read a recipe in your local paper and decide it sounds good. The frustration starts when you have 40 people arriving in 20 minutes and are still trying to figure out a substitute meal. The degradation comes when you find yourself on your hands and knees begging your local store manager to find anything he can in his storeroom that could be disguised as the item you need. Take it from me. Canned pumpkin does not substitute for eggplant in even a minor way. I go through these same changes on those off times of the year when I decide I should put some perfume on. The perfume I ended up using on New Year's Eve was originally created for a fashion model doll. She has bizarre cravings and odors. I felt like I was wearing a citrus fruit that had stayed too long at the fair. If there had been bees around, I'm sure they would have attempted pollination. I wish I had real stuff like the other grown-ups I know, but these things are not part of my daily life in the bush, so I'm never prepared when the occasional need arises. The Alaska bush is not the place to be if you're going to discover at 11 o'clock at night that you need a specific, non-allergenic type of shampoo or your scalp is going to turn red and get acne. Then again, I hear that a little whale fat rubbed on the hives can do more than all the medicine you can buy. Combine that with a little caribou red sauce over pasta and the routine availability of zucchini falls into its proper and minor perspective. Thanks, Elise. Your caribou with red sauce sounds a lot better than eggplant anyway. Well, this wraps up another segment of Heartbeat Alaska. Thank you so much for joining me. If you have video from your community, please call. I'm looking for a video from fish camps all over the state this summer. For Heartbeat Alaska, I'm Jeannie Green, bringing you native news across the north. See you next week.